welcome to Coronavirus Your Stories, a programme about how COVID-19 is changing lives around the world. I'm Philippa Thomas and this week we're looking at education, where there's been enormous upheaval over the past six months. As country after country went into lockdown, millions of schools closed their doors. Those that were able to took their teaching online. Well now, in many places, we're in back-to-school season. And this week we'll hear stories about how the pandemic has already transformed teaching and what it feels like when going back to the classroom is not an easy option. Later, we'll speak to an American interning here in the UK who's campaigning for students like herself who are immunocompromised and so most at risk from going back on campus. First, two teachers with two very different stories about how they've adapted during the pandemic. Peter Tabichi is a science teacher in remote rural Kenya who took home the Varki Foundation Global Teacher Prize last year. Jamie Frost is a London maths teacher who's a finalist for that award this year. Jamie, if I can come to you first. Here in the UK, COVID has meant remote teaching. How has that been for you? we've been able to continue lessons to a degree of normalcy, obviously without that face-to-face -face interaction. But we've, um, we've done our best to try and maintain the usual routine of a school day. So there's, the lessons are still at the normal time. Um, we're sort of encouraged to try and have as many live meetings as possible. Um, I do many things I'd usually do in a lesson, like when I'm teaching from some PowerPoints, for example. I can still use those. I just have to annotate it over with a, a virtual pen and they can see that. I can still speak to students and such and target students for questioning. Um, so it's been very different, but it, it's been interesting how it's sort of in some ways become a, a kind of new norm that we've been, we've been doing it for so long that, that it just became, <laughs> seemed relatively normal. Peter, I think your story is different. How has the coronavirus changed the way you teach? Yeah, I can say that uh, it has had um, um, a very negative impact. You know, as a teacher, we are used to going to class and teaching and, uh, you know, face to face. But right now it's not happening. And I can say that many educators and teachers can agree with me that face to face, you know, teaching is uh, very important. I can say that um, teaching science is not very easy at the moment because you need the practical aspect. You need to have students, you know, around with you, you know, putting them in groups. Right now it's not possible. And therefore, that's one of the challenges I'm experiencing, though there are a number of things I'm doing to ensure that uh, something's done, but it's not possible to achieve that. You know, not having the routine of school, uh, you know, students not going to school has impacted my students in many ways. For example, they greatly miss their friends because every day they were interacting with them, but right now they are not interacting with them. And then the other thing is that they are not able to have access to things like cadres and counseling and even free meals, which they used to enjoy at school. Yeah. Jamie, there's clearly a different story between the two schools, but the fact that pupils, that all of us are social beings, that must make a difference for the, the students that you're teaching too. And yes, in, indeed, we, we, I, I, have same, same, I have some of the same problems as Peter at my school. So the fact that we, we don't have that face-to-face -face interaction in terms of pastoral support for these students, obviously it's still much more difficult um, without being able to actually see them face-to-face. So, for example, I've been trying to organise at least weekly uh, form times with the students just to check on, 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 on their welfare and such uh, and sort of catch up with them, what they've been doing the week and such. Um, but it, it has been more difficult. And just like when these students can't see each other because they're having to isolate their own houses. Um, and, and I know they, they communicate via social media apps and, and such in a, similar way, in a similar way they would when they're actually coming to school anyway. But it's just not the same. And I think students are going to be... Um, incredibly glad uh, when they can come back to school and, and have that normal interaction between each other. I want to ask you a bit more about how you teach. So Jamie, even before the pandemic, you were something of a whiz with virtual teaching. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yes, yeah, so um, I, I run a platform called Dr. Ross Maths and it's, it's used by several thousand schools. And note, by the way, that all, the, all these will eventually have like um, a worked example video. Um, so I'll show you an example of those later because I have made a few of those. And um, it's awesome. actually come to play quite a lot during the pandemic um, because there's certain software that I've developed that, that helps schools in terms of uh, remote teaching. So you've got things like the teaching resources and a number of 
teachers have been using my slides and such for their lessons. Another way that you can think about it is area. Some have even been making YouTube videos uh, where they've been teaching my slides, which has been great. Um, but there's also, for example, like a, a virtual whiteboard. Um, and I've used that an awful lot using, uh, during uh, my teaching. So that allows me to connect with uh, students' whiteboards so I can see what they're writing on their boards and I can import exam questions and stuff. Um, and I've been trying to adapt, actually, my technology since the lockdown uh, so I can support students better. So, for example, um, one thing I was doing before the lockdown, which worked really effectively, was um, I might set a G2C paper during the lesson, but via my platform. Um, and I can basically sit on my computer and I can see live uh, their answers coming in so I could identify like, what question lots of students have some misconception with. Um, and you can imagine how helpful that's been during uh, the lockdown. So I've, I've adapted further so that you can actually see live as they come in without me having to refresh what they're doing. Um, and that way I can still get this kind of assessment for learning without having to actually see the students visually. Peter, you're in a very rural area of Kenya. Getting online is not that easy for, for students. Tell me about the way you're trying to use technology. The, the, the students even uh, don't have access to their computers. Even in my own school, we don't have those facilities. So what I'm doing right now is um, uh, is that I, I uh, you know, I, I, I support the idea that learning is a continuous process. You know, even if they are not, the students are not in school, learning should still take place. And there's, no, you know, it's not limited to the four world classroom. <laughs> I give them affordable mobile phones because that's what they can afford right now. And then uh, at the same time, I give them weekly internet bundles because they have to be connected. Without that, you cannot be able to connect with them. And then at the same time, apart from just giving them phones and the internet bundles, I collaborate with the other teachers to give them continuous online mentorship because that's very important for them to be able to know how to use these mobile phones, how to, you know, which are the websites they are going to use, like what my colleague from UK has said, he has a very nice, uh, you know, website which they can use offline because most of the time, we, as I said, we don't have, uh, um, you know, internet around here. And then the other thing that I do as part of this program is that we also help parents and the guardians with teaching tips because you know even my own father you know my own my own you know, most of the things i learned i learned from my balance my own father was a teacher and therefore i can say that even learning can take place at home not just even at school and therefore we help parents and guardians with teaching tips so that they can also help their children learn about practical aspects and life skills while they are at home Jamie, I wonder if you've got any reflections on what we've just heard from Peter. A, a very, it's a very holistic approach to education. I know um, that I, and my school's in a very lucky situation compared to Peter's in terms of the provision we have, uh, in terms of availability of internet um, and, and such. And um, I, I think it's, it's, it's how we can best use the resources we have to support students in that completely holistic way, pastorally, academically, uh, spiritually, etc. Jamie, one report that's come out in the UK this week uh, says that what the pandemic has done is shown that those who are better off have done better from education. You know, more resources at schools, at home, etc. Those who are worse off socially, economically, uh, have really struggled, may have lost as much as three months of education. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, I suppose, a worry for the whole teacher community. Absolutely. And I, I think it's why it's so imperative um, that we, we make sure, and, and I think it's a government responsibility here, to ensure that all students have some kind of device which has reliable internet um, that they can access as education. Because technology has so much power to transform education, but it, we have to make sure that every student has the kind of appropriate access to it. Peter, I'd like to know more about what's been happening to your students. How would you say the pandemic has affected your community? Yeah, I can say that the, the community has been affected, everyone has been affected, you know, we used to go to school and we, you know, we had that routine, you know, you know that you are going to wake up, you go, you know, you teach, you interact with the students and then with the other teachers in the staff room. But right now, that's not happening. And I can say that um, there is, uh, that has had a, a, a psychosocial effect on us and even the students in the, the community. So. Um, currently, many students are staying at home with their parents, and I can say that majority 
uh, I'll doing nothing, you know, to keep them busy and active. You know, young people, they like, you know, they like being uh, active and interacting with the others. And uh, this has led to boredom. And um, in, uh, uh, you know, I'm sorry to say that we have seen cases whereby, you know, this has resulted to things like, you know, drug abuse, even teenage pregnancies, uh, even earlier marriage. And then even as teachers, we, we are, you know, we have some fears, fears some students may not be able to report back to school when the schools are going to reopen. I hope that's going to happen soon. Our students also used to enjoy free meals, you know, that were being offered. But right now, that's not happening because, you know, most of our students come from very poor homes. And uh, there is uh, where there's a very serious food shortage. Uh, and therefore, I can say that some parents are trying to teach, uh, uh, they are trying to teach their, you know, their ch children. I can say this is the time when they are appreciating the, you know, the importance of our teachers. You know, they are now seeing how, you know, the great work that the teachers are doing. Uh, but I can say that there's some, you know, light at the end of the tunnel. And that's why I'm so happy with the initiative being taken by the government, the Ministry of Education and other education stakeholders to ensure that they, you know, they come up with the solutions and how to ensure that there's safety in schools, you know, that even when, there's, when the schools reopen, that the students are safe and even the teachers are safe and the learning uh, continues. One silver lining, I can say this as a parent, is that parents really appreciate teachers, having seen much more of what they do. Uh, Jamie, a final thought for you. Do you think education really has changed forever? I think there's certain practices that, that I think will change as we come back into teaching. I think obviously schools have been incredibly reliant on technology in, in the UK. Um, and already in just a staff meeting this morning and because this is my first day of school and we were discussing how we're going to use that technology more even though that we're in school now um certain things like um parents evenings we're going to do online now um and certain aspects of our lessons we're, we're still using the same technology we were using a few months ago and i think yes there will there'll be certain things that will be back to normal um my teaching is not going to change drastically but certainly i think i'll have a greater reliance on technology as, as, as we come back to normal teaching Peter Tabici in Kenya's Rift Valley and Jamie Frost here in London. Two of the many ingenious and inspiring teachers around the world determined not to let the virus stop them. You're watching Coronavirus Your Stories, a programme about how COVID-19 is changing so many lives around the world. I'm Philippa Thomas and this week we're looking at education. It's back to school season for so many students. But what if you want to keep studying online because you're clinically vulnerable? You fear that going back to school could actually damage your health. 19-year-old Cameron Lynch is just finishing an internship here in London with Disability Rights UK. She's due to continue her education back home in Virginia in the United States, but worries that after months of online learning, physically going back to school could pose a serious risk to her health. When she spoke up about this, she realised she's not alone. Cameron has been telling me her story. I have type 1 diabetes, a form of muscular dystrophy called dermatomyositis and celiac disease. So returning to campus for the fall semester is dangerous for my health. And I believe that I'm not necessarily given the same opportunities as my able-bodied peers in order to take the same classes and have the same graduation track as I am supposed to. So I have been trying to make sure that I still get the same educational opportunities as um, my other peers and to make sure that I am not falling behind in my work and trying to do the same for other students with disabilities as well. Tell us about the letter that you wrote and you put it on social media, and what happened? So in June, I wrote a letter talking to my college-age peers about how their use of social media broadcasting that they didn't care about the isolation or the pandemic and were continuing living their lives was impacting my mental health because I was still in complete isolation, still hadn't seen anyone for a couple months. And so it was very hurtful to me to watch my friends go about their lives. And I didn't expect this to happen, but I had maybe 40 other college students with disabilities or with um, autoimmune conditions reach out to me telling me how much 
my letter mean to them and how they felt less alone. So I then turned this into a support group for immunocompromised college students to have people to talk to and to have someone who understands their frustrations. Can you give us an idea of, of the, the range of disabilities or vulnerabilities that the mm -hmm. students you're talking to are dealing with? There's 50 of us in the group. We have a very wide range of um, conditions. We have some students who are in wheelchairs. There's a lot of students with dis diabetes, similar to myself. Um, but we kind of have a lot of autoimmune conditions. And right now, this week, in many countries, there's a lot of talk about going back to school. And it's seen as a physical thing, moving back onto uh, schools, uh, campuses. Um, but for you, do, do you feel that the conversation simply overlooks you? Yes, I would say so. I think there are very few schools who have even acknowledged their immunocompromised students or even acknowledged the presence of us and acknowledging that this is a very difficult time for us. We've been in complete isolation for five months now, um, and it's not an option. It's to, for us to go back to school, I think there's a lot of narrative about choosing to go back or not choosing. If I could choose, I would be back on campus at my school in a heartbeat, but I don't have that decision. That was already made for me by my health and by my doctors, so I am staying at home. And my biggest concern moving forward is I'm worried that students who are still at home are getting left out of the conversation and out of communities. So I'm trying to increase awareness for the mental health of students with disabilities because I know that a lot of them are feeling completely isolated and completely alone. So how can we make sure they still feel cared for and still feel like their universities or colleges still know who they are? And what, Cameron, would make enough of a difference? What specifically are you asking for? Is it all classes to be also available online? Yes, so I think there has been confusion of what I'm asking for. I'm not saying that I want all classes to only be available online. I'm just asking that we have the same opportunities to take classes that able-bodied students have. So if the class is only offered in person, we obviously can't take that class. So I'm just asking for them to consider us and consider us in their decision about classes and having them available to us even if we're not able on campus because we know they can do it. It's not beyond their jurisdiction. They did it in the spring when they shut down campus and they have continued to show that if a student were to get COVID-19, they can continue their classes online from quarantine. So why can't we do that from the beginning? Student years are often meant to be the best years of your life, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> yes, and I think that is, there's a rhetoric around college as these are the best four years of your lives. These are the best years. You'll never have the same life again. And I think it's very damaging for mental health of students who aren't able to live that life. And to begin with, disabled students don't get the same kind of college experience that normal college students get. So this rhetoric of this is the best time you'll ever have. These are the best days of your lives. That's not necessarily true for everyone. It's we have to fight to even go to college in the first place. So it is hard to hear that I will never be as happy as I am in these four years when I'm still sitting at home um, trying to maintain a sense of healthiness and trying to um, just take my classes and do my internship. Does it expose that and provide an opportunity? You are a great example of a student with disabilities, clinically vulnerable, speaking up and getting others to hear you. Yes, I think it definitely, as much as this pandemic has been stressful and has been kind of a um, very terrible time to have disabilities, it has given me a community. I've met so many students who also have disabilities who I kind of felt alone before and having to fight for my rights at school and having to do all of this. And I've been able to help other students realize that they're not alone and that they have a sense of community still, even if it 
is a virtual sense. And we've already talked about one day after all of this is over, meeting up and finding a way to connect in person. So I think it's definitely given me a community. It's also given me a voice and it's given me a passion. Um, through this project, I've started an internship at Disability Rights UK, which has also given me a great platform to continue to work for change here in the UK. And I'm able to kind of be a voice for young people with disabilities because we're often forgotten about in the media. And I think that it's really important to bring awareness that people like me still exist in the world. There's still people, not all um, young adults are out partying with their friends. There are still people like me who are still scared and still needing to take it very seriously. What do you say to young adults in that situation? Because there'll be a lot of people who are watching, who are alone and may be struggling in the way that you describe. I would say that you're not alone. There are a lot of people out there who are still having to take it seriously and still in your position and know that it eventually this will be over and we will be stronger for it. And people, young people with disabilities, we're fighters. We know the meaning of life and we know from a younger age kind of our own um, how what it takes to survive um, which sounds dramatic but so we have a greater sense of empathy I would say so use that to your advantage how can you speak up for what you believe in and speak up for what you need because a lot of times we have to fight for everything so how can we make it so that the people who are younger than us won't have to fight as much or as hard Cameron Lynch on the dilemma for clinically vulnerable students like her who want to pursue their learning without damaging their health. I'm Philippa Thomas. Thank you for watching this week's Coronavirus Your Stories.